Although humans have been digging trenches for over 4,000 years, it was only in the past 200 years that we have been able to create them underwater. This is all thanks to a device known as a tunneling shield. You can truly understand the tremendous loads it was built to handle with this interior view. Along either bank of the river, two similar shields were built and then dropped into gigantic pre-dug pits. The actual excavation is a three-step procedure that repeats itself. Using hydraulic jacks, the shield is first driven into the soft dirt. Workers then retrieve the material that has been hauled up to the surface secured by the shield. The soil excavated from this tunnel is used to build a large chunk of the international airport I mentioned previously. To prevent the roof from collapsing if the shield is removed, a strong internal concrete and steel wall is built right beneath the shield. The jacks are energized and the shield glides onwards into the darkness once the edges are ready to handle the load. A somewhat same procedure was employed on one of the summer tunnels 30 years later. However, this time to cater to Boston's burgeoning interest in automobiles. What's strange about this tunnel is that while the original cross-section was a circle, the current cross-section is much more rectangular. That's a lot of mined material that doesn't get put to good use. So how did they manage to cram a square tube into a round hole? There are around 250 tons of sand, silt, water, and ducts pushing down on every meter portion of the crossing at its deepest point. That's a lot of force, so let's see whether it works. I've made my experiment using some folded bits of paper as well as a fish tank to see if the design of your tunnel has anything to do with its ability to endure that strain. We have a circular portion, which was cut into the tunnel, a square, which would be the most economical, and finally, a triangle, which I've read is the strongest shape. I'm going to put some sand and a bunch of bricks in there, how they hold up under pressure, and see which one cracks first. The triangle is the first to crumble, then by the rectangle, and ultimately, the circle. I wouldn't feel very safe under either of our tunnels, given the tremendous deformation we saw. They're made of paper to begin with. Circles, on the other hand, were the most effective, considering their smoother sides and lack of angles meant that there are no stress concentration locations, tension was equally distributed, and the construction lasted longer. This means that if we're going to build a transatlantic tunnel or any other tunnel under high load conditions, circles are the perfect shape to go with. Our tunnel dullard takes us about 400 kilometers off the coast, but as we descend past the continental shelf, even our cylindrical shell would be squashed by the extreme pressure. You'll also come across the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which experiences weekly magnitude 5 earthquakes and genuine lava. We need to have a tunnel above the seafloor to avoid being squashed by the pressure, yet below the surface to avoid being damaged by storms and pirates. A unique type of tunnel that was pioneered right here in this parking lot. I could now go on to explain the process within said space lot, but I believe I've discovered something far more fascinating just up ahead. A recreation of the 1773 merchant ship that served as the epicenter of the Tea Party. A group of roughly 100 colonists climbed aboard late at night to dump the ship's cargo of taxable British tea directly into the Fort Point Channel. About 200 years later, it was the epicenter of yet another revolution this time the Boston Big Dig Revolution, to improved transportation, rather than the American Revolution for independence. As it seems out, the very characteristics that make it so appealing to shippers, especially its central position and vast size, also makes it misery for Boston's rail and road systems. 
The Big Dig was indeed a massive construction project that took place from 1991 to 2007 to open up the city and reduce traffic congestion. This had previously been attempted in the most 1950s American manner conceivable with a gigantic elevated freeway cutting across the CBD. The Big Dig attempted a unique strategy by replacing old highways and constructing some new ones, all of which were built underground. The new Ted Williams Tunnel underneath the Charles River required to be attached to the Massachusetts Turnpike and Highway 1, which was especially important for this episode. A path that runs directly through the Fort Point Channel, which is both large and central. The issue with this concept was the lack of available space. The U.S. Postal Service is on that side, and the Gillette Corporation has its global headquarters here. The red line, which would be the subway system below me, is the busiest part of the entire infrastructure. So we can't cross the river because there isn't enough area, and these companies aren't willing to relocate. We can't go beneath because there's an old train line along the route. The only way out was to navigate the Fort Point Channel. It's quite difficult to construct structures underwater. As you can guess, if I tried to assemble this box, the masking tape wouldn't attach properly. The cardboard would crumble, and I'd have a lot of trouble just folding it up from the beginning if I were wearing dive gear. I attempted to rent any scuba gear to demonstrate how tough it would be, but swimming in the Charles is illegal owing to high quantities of green algae. There are solutions for each of these scenarios, such as deploying trained divers with specialized underwater equipment and concrete that is specifically intended to work in this environment. They are, however, extremely expensive and should be only used for one-time tasks. Surprisingly, Getting rid of the water should be the initial step in underwater construction. Engineers made advantage of a casting basin when building the Fort Point Channel's crossover. That's where a makeshift dam is built against the canal and a pit is created behind it. Because we're so adept at building things on dry land, this is the ideal time for us to do some tweaking. A normal tunnel can accommodate a maximum of two teams at any given time one on one side of the large body of water, and the other tunneling to meet in the middle. However, now that we have already found a foundry basin, including all the production advantages that comes with it, we can do some parallelization. You understand, if I had to create one enormous tea chest by myself, it would take a long time. But if we split it up, it would take much less time. The basin was submerged, and portions drifted out into position once the real tunnels were finished being built. Pylons were erected down into the bedrock to prevent the red line from becoming crushed. The ballast tanks flooded when the order was given, and tunnel segments sunk to rest on their supports. Using these principles, we can construct a tunnel that runs the length of the oceans and is held in place by gigantic pylons. Alternatively, instead of filling the ballast tanks, we may carefully adjust their volume allowing us to stay neutrally buoyant like a large submarine. We could use gigantic tethering lines or carefully regulated rockets to keep it in position. It affects the life of everyone who lives there. Who wonders what we'll come up with if we add another hundred years of creativity to the mix? That's all for today's video and thanks for watching it. If you liked it, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and share it with your friends. And before you leave, Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already done so, and turn on notifications to never miss any updates. I will see you in the next video. Take care and stay tuned.